Hi, welcome to episode 27 of the Anthrozoology podcast. I'm Michelle Sidlowski. My PhD is in anthrozoology and my focus is on elephant-human relations. I'm Chris and uh, my research focuses on cat-human relations and discourses surrounding um, urban roaming cats. Hi, I'm Sarah and I'm looking at shark-human relationships and I'm also interested in um, feline lives in Saudi Arabia based on my master's dissertation. Today we're starting a new recurrent theme on the podcast, which is focused on the history, definition, current state, and future of the field of human-animal studies and anthrozoology. These episodes will be interspersed among our other content throughout the upcoming year. Today we're honored to welcome Dr. Ken Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro is a clinical psychologist focused on the assessment and treatment of juveniles and adults who abuse animals. He's also the founder of the Animals and Society Institute, founding editor of Society and Animals Journal, and the Brill Human Animal Studies book series. He also co-founded the Journal of Applied Animal Welfare Science. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, pleasure to be here. As I said, today we're gonna to start exploring the state of the fields of anthrozoology and human animal studies with an eye on the past, the present, and the future. So to begin, Ken, could you just tell us briefly how you first started in the field of human animal studies and what was your motivation for founding the Animals and Society Institute? Okay. Well, the, you know, there's a, uh, there's a long story and a short story, and there's a personal story, personal psychology, if you will, and a professional story. But anyway, um, so I was uh, teaching at Bates College in the psychology department. Singer's book came out 1975, and there was a significant chapter in it on uh, animal research problems and in which he featured psychology animal research in psychology really took us to task. So on that occasion, I decided to have a, uh, to call a conference at Bates College. This is in 1980 now. And uh, of course, only 11 people came, but one of them was Tom Reagan. Oh. And so we, we learned about uh, animal rights. And another one was a fellow named Manny Bernstein, a fellow psychologist. And he and I decided to start a, a, a group called Psychologists for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And so it's, it's primarily targeting animal research in psychology in general. Uh, we both looked at uh, scientific critiques of it. And I wrote a book about that the science-based critique, as well as ethical concerns. So that was the start. Um, more personally, um, I, I was in the early days an environmentalist. Uh, I had some uh, incidents at Duke where I was a grad student in which I observed uh, these animals in very bad straits in terms of stereotactic devices. I, I remember walking by this uh, in the physiological psychology part of the of the building, walking by this open door and doing a double take, I, I thought someone was looking at me. I walked back and there was a cat in a stereotaxic uh, device so that it couldn't move its head. And it was looking out at me. And uh, I had very, very strong reaction to that. Uh, on the other side, I'm going on and on here, but anyway, on the other side, um, I was introduced to bird watching while I was uh, at Duke. And I remember the, the fabulous experience, the initial experience of looking through my binoculars and seeing this bluebird uh, and, and, and really realizing how beautiful it was, that it could fly, uh, that it had its own world and life. And, and I could sort of enter into it vicariously. So I, I both, uh, I, I was pulled into the animal issue from various threads, the environment, uh, my, my relationship with an, a possible animal, uh, and, and the exploit, exploitative stuff that I had seen. Fascinating. So that brings me to an interesting point, because in a lot of your videos and your papers, you mentioned that human animal studies has a, a scholar advocate role, right? That it's got this focus on that. Could you talk a little bit about why that's important and how maybe that sets um, human animal studies apart from some of the other names for the field? Oh, other names for the field. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm, interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Um, yeah, so uh, I mean, I'm I'm wearing a few hats. Um, psychologist. Uh, I now identify as a human animal studies scholar, uh, and my primary identity since 1981 or two has been I'm an animal advocate. So pretty much everything that I undertake, that's my subtext, and that's my purpose. Um, so the question of um, the relationship between scholarship and uh, advocacy, uh, complicated one. Um, by and large, the public seems to accept that uh, an environmental scientist is a is a proponent of better lives for animals, and a child psychologist is a proponent of better lives for children. And so a human animal study scholar is a proponent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and, and it's gotten more acceptable in the academy to be an advocate. Uh, we all realize that uh, we, we're not entirely objective, that we bring our values and perspectives and biases to our choice of the research we do, uh, how we undertake it, uh, what we put in our courses as, as uh, material. So um, there's this, still some resistance to coming out, if, if you will, as an animal advocate when you do scholarship, particularly in the natural sciences where the uh, criterion of objectivity and, and, the, and the claim that you can be completely objective is the, is the practice that they follow. It's the regulative I ideal. Whereas in the humanities, it's much more acceptable to say, well, you know, this is where I'm coming from. This is my point of view. This is the kind of interpretation that I provide. So um, there's tension, but um, another, another consideration from my point of view is that as the field of human animal studies got established more and, re and, and gained some credibility uh, and moved a little bit from the margin into the center of the field, of, of the academic fields, uh, it was less risky to uh, also have um, recommendations for policy change as part of the studies and to uh, indicate explicitly uh, you know, that you were, were an animal advocate or that you were a vegetarian or, or so forth. So um, the, the, the academy itself has become more progressive in that, in that sense. Certainly the public expects people who have expertise in an area to be advocates for that area in some way. So anyway. So can I ask you a quick question about, um, you said about it's less risk, and it's less risky now to be an advocate. When you uh, met uh, Reagan and you um, started the Institute, did you have any pushback from your colleagues and from the institution itself, from the university? And do you find there's more pushback now that it's kind of becoming, it seems to be becoming more risky in terms of career shaping and unless somebody is established, it's possibly more difficult to speak up in certain disciplines would you agree with that or do you think that's not the case um I, let me just talk about it for a few minutes and then if i don't respond to what you're asking in terms of my own uh affiliation with bates college uh there was very there was really no pushback when i decided to have this conference although, although there wasn't that much support but w one interesting uh, anecdote uh, maybe too much detail but as you know, uh, one, of the, one of the early animal welfare acts required universities and colleges who were funded by the government to have animal care, um, they're called IACUCs, animal care committees, uh, much like human subject committees. And uh, the interesting thing at Bates uh, was that they started one of those, unbeknownst to me, not only not inviting me, not even telling me that they were doing it, so, um, but you know, there was no there was no serious pushback. More more generally, um, my sense is that um, we've come a long way in the sense that that uh, many that, that that the field of human animal studies and by association the animal protection movement are are much more on the public agenda and on the academic agenda, uh, on the table, if you will. So that uh, the. the it, there's more acceptance. I mean, there's still, uh, there is pushback for sure. Uh, students uh, that came to our summer institute 
uh, which we you know had for graduate students and and recently finished graduate students, uh, they would often complain that they didn't have enough support at their university. And that, you know, they approached their sociology professor, if, 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 for example, and, and said they wanted to do a, a study that involved uh, human-animal relationships within a sociological frame, and, they, and the, they wouldn't get much support, they might get some pushback, etc. Uh, so th that's still going on, but um, we now have so many courses uh, in, in the human animal studies and animal studies and anthropology and so forth and so on, uh, that it's, you know, it's, it's the, the pushback is not as strong. The other thing I'm seeing is that uh, particularly some of the smaller colleges uh, are really looking for uh, a, a PR niche for themselves, if you will. And they, they sometimes grab onto animal studies and, you know, okay, so we'll and sometimes that's incorporated within a particular discipline. Sometimes it's more stand on its own. But we've made significant progress in terms of um, social acceptability, both in the academy uh, and in the public. But uh, but you know, still we're, we're considered um, uh, sometimes considered a marginal field. We're considered a niche field sometimes. There's also that paper uh, I can't remember who wrote it now. Um, used the term dirty. Dirty, was it? dirty work, Wilkie. Dirty work. Dirty Thank work. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah. That, you know, that's that's still you know a response sometimes that you know uh, this is this is you, you get your hands dirty somehow when you go into this field. Uh, so, sorry, just an addendum to that question. What about funding pushback? Is there you know from the, from various industries and lobbies and all this kind of stuff? I mean, are they are they getting stronger in terms of not wanting this? Pandora's box to be opened because once once um, it possibly is, then there'll be less ability to exploit animals in the uh, traditional way that we, as many societies do. Yes. So in terms of uh, corporate foundation funding, that, I guess that's what you're getting at. Mm. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. It, it's certainly the you know the meat industries and the poultry industries and so forth are you know are really um very concerned about you know lose, losing their stock and trade um uh, but you know there are there are like this waltham uh pet food thing that you know they support uh the, the journal anthrozos and have for many years uh but you know it, it's it's certainly a problem that um they're fighting against vegetarianism uh there's a real threat for them uh but in terms of the animal research area, I, I think um, it's more accepted now, particularly in the social sciences, to do work involving animals uh, and to seek funding for that. In terms of governmental support, uh, I'm, I'm not really, I'm, I'm really not in that loop anymore. Um, but you know, people do get some funding, uh, and again, there are uh, position openings occurring. Uh, so that the universities, to some extent, are funding, if you will. Anyway, I don't have a great answer to that question, uh, and it's certainly an ongoing problem. Thank you. I think there is still some, because my own work crosses the, the natural sciences, social sciences boundary, and it, it has been difficult to, I guess, be taken seriously, if you will, on the natural sciences side, as someone who advocates for animals and animal welfare, I, I I have faced a lot of pushback from, you know, more on the the natural sciences side than the social sciences side, and so I think for a lot of people, they end up shifting more heavily into the social science side just because it's so much easier to find acceptance and publication and, you know, along those lines. So. Yeah, I mean, there is the field of, anim of environmental studies, which is a natural science, not, not environmental uh, cultural studies, but environmental science, if you will, that, uh, you know, provides an opening and some of the animal people can slip in there to some extent, even though there's some tension between environment and animal protection, um, there's a lot of overlap as well in terms of interests. Yeah, I guess so. I, I have a couple of sort of related related questions or points. So I, I personally, I would call myself an animal advocate um, because I I want I want my research or I'm 
yeah, I'm, I'm committed to helping other animals, in, including humans who care for those animals. So I would call myself an animal advocate. I'm definitely pro cats. I'm, um, yeah, I love cats. I, I have an affinity towards cats, but I'm not anti bird. And I, so, so my PhD, I delved into the indoor outdoor cat debate from different and, angles. And I'm carrying that on in, in my, my continuing studies to sort of really look at this tension between cat cats and bird watchers and environmentalists and um yeah I guess the sort of more that I've delved into the indoor outdoor cat debate the less committed I've been to any sort of one side and I um it's it's something uh, yeah that I I struggle with ongoing this sort of conflict between I mean in most environments they can only take a finite number of cats and um yeah, I, 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 that's actually not really a question. It's just <laughs> um, sort of something that I, I guess I struggle with. Um, I, I can comment on it if you. Yes, you know, Paige, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's a huge issue and it's a it's a divisive one within the animal protection movement, uh, as well as the animal protection movement versus the environment, which is where it's clearly divisive. Uh, by the way, Society of Animals did uh, publish a special issue on outdoor cats. Bill Lynn edited it, I think. Um, I wasn't totally in agreement with what the positions he took. I mean, he primarily was arguing that we don't have enough data. And uh, so, you know, whether it's uh, whether the, the, the cats are killing uh, 10 million or 100 million, or, you know, that, that it's a big number. Uh, so, um, but, you know, in the United States, the cat is primarily uh, a, a domesticated animal within the structure of the family, even if they're allowed outdoors. But in much of the rest of the world, they're they're just outdoor, you know, they're village animals. And so in, in Turkey, for example, um, there are cats all over the place in both rural and Istanbul, which has 20 million people, uh, by the way. Um, and, and I don't know how many cats, but I mean, the cats are well cared for. And you probably have seen that movie, Keddy. Do you know the movie yeah. Keddy? Yeah. So anyway, that that's true. I mean, the, 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 the people... Uh, don't have the cats inside their house, uh, although there's a growing middle class, but the, but they they love the cats and they put out little dishes of water and food and the cats, I mean, all the cats I found looked at were in good health, they had, you know, nice good coats and so forth. So, um, but on the other hand, um, there's no other animals in Istanbul besides the cats and the dogs. I mean, the the, the wildlife what wildlife uh so i mean uh you know as i mentioned i, I was originally an environmentalist and hold on to that and wildlife is very very important to me uh and i have mixed feelings about cats and dogs even though i'm a a dog lover beyond belief um so uh, you know it's a very complicated issue um i hate to say this but uh the cat is out of the bag uh in the sense that the cats have established themselves all over the world uh, and, you know, the spay neuter thing is helpful. Uh, by the way, there is some, uh, this foundation called Botswinger or something. They, they are developing, um, they've been working for years on developing sterilization methods that are just by injection or something. And um, that would really help the problem if we could not add to the uh, spay neuter, what's it called, TNO or whatever. TNOVM. Trap, neuter, um, vaccinate, yeah. release, and manage. Right, yeah. right. Uh, these acronyms are getting beyond me. Um, <laughs> I mean, if we could add to that a very simple way of, of uh, sterilizing these animals and, you know, that didn't need to be repeated every year, et cetera, uh, because um, both the, in, the, the, the cats that are with part of the family but outdoors and the cats that are part of the village situation, uh it, it's it's pushing back against uh wildlife for sure it's and it's just one of many factors and as bill lynn says you know you need to look at it on a situation by situation basis um but uh it, it's it's an ongoing problem uh, in defense of cats if i may uh because uh, this arguments off obviously it's very prolific um what, are there studies that you've seen that talk about how many, um, how many, how much wildlife humans contribute to the to to the killing of versus cats? Um, because uh, one of the things I was reading was about the um, 
there's and I don't have the data I haven't I haven't researched it in detail but I have um, seen articles um, floating around about uh, reflective buildings they contribute to millions of birds being killed every year when, when, when we talk about cats do we also look out beyond into our own uh, contributions to the detriment of wildlife so uh, your initial query was uh, what's the comparative loss from mm. human factors versus cat factors uh to me that that isn't really i'm sorry a relevant question okay uh because uh you know we need to deal with all the ways in which uh wildlife are threatened and uh you know if if, if humans uh, as i'm sure they do uh, produce a thousand times more loss than cats we still can work on the cat issue there's a lot of us working so I'm, I'm not sure, but you know, certainly human the human influence is you know dramatic, yeah. and and, we, and we're responsible for the cats. I mean, we 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 domesticated the cats, and we decided whether they'd be in the house or not in the house. We decided whether to feed them in the streets or not, et cetera, et cetera. We decided, you know, whether we would have to sterilize them, on and on and on. So, you know, it's intersectionality there for sure. You can't separate those out. But uh, yeah, the the the, the windows issue—that's what you were raising. The uh, yeah, it's I one mean, of the issues. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah. it's huge. And there's a there's a group here in Washington D.C. that that focuses on that on that very issue. And um, you know, if you look at my house, you'd see all these little uh, medallion type things blocking the windows. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, it, it's a very serious problem. Yes. Um, one of many, many. Yeah, many, thank many, you. Many, yeah. many holes in the dike. Yeah, I do agree that it's it is deflecting. And so in my analysis, that was one of the things from the the general public responding to articles about cats. Whenever anybody brought up the damage caused by cats, it was this whole slew of comments like how humans were 20 times worse. And um it was very sort of reactionary and in defense of um <laughs> yeah, so I do recognize my own inherent bias towards cats. I I am. Um, and I guess that's we all have these sort of in, inherent biases and that that what kind of bothers me a little bit about research that is funded by the pet food companies. And, and it's bringing me back to this this veganism vegetarian issue. And so, so, so I think, you know, Tom Aleo, we did his his he did he did a PhD at Exeter with us and he came right. on one of these podcasts. He's, and, on, he's on the board of ASI. Yeah, yeah. 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 And he'll probably stand behind this, but he said something along the lines of you can't be an anthrozoologist and non-vegan, <laughs> um, which I thought was an interesting, provocative point. But it does oh. bring me back to this. Um, and I've been to a lot of animal studies conferences where they serve meat. And um, yeah, and I've also been to, to other conferences not related to anthrozoology where they don't. It's sort of environmentally, it's becoming a big thing to have vegetarian um offerings at these events so i just wondered if you comment on that can you be a a human animal studies scholar and eat meat <laughs> obviously you can no, but <laughs> yeah, yeah obviously you can obviously you can i mean is it ethically what is your thoughts on that um sort of is it best uh, is it ethically consistent um my, my view on this is is um to, to draw a str strong distinction between uh the pub the, the professional face and the personal face and uh, in some ways, uh, if if a, if a scholar is making uh, innovative theoretical or empirical contributions to the field and and eats his um, liver every other, you know, uh, I, I'm I'm willing to go with that. We we can't we can't be that we can't be that purist and and, and choosy. So, uh, but in terms of the public face, uh, certainly I think that. Uh, organizations like ASI need to be at least vegetarian in any of their activities and 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 these days vegan because it's gotten I mean it's gotten so much easier to be vegan it's unbelievable I can remember when I was first drifting in that direction in the 80s and 90s you know I, I had to um, uh, put my soybeans in water for three days before I could digest them you know and now, and now you know it's 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 all over the place you know there's there's hundreds and hundreds of products coming out uh and there's also the um you know the the, the cultured meat technology breakthrough which I think is is going to be huge you're, you're familiar with that I'm sure yeah yeah, yeah. 
I, the I, Beyond I, Meat. It's delicious. You know, this is not beyond. This is not beyond. Okay. This, this is this is uh, in vitro meat. This is right. Yeah. So I so mean, the lab grown, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, lab grown, and I think you know, I think that's coming, uh, and it will, I mean, because its target audience is carnists, not vegetarians, yeah. and uh, you know, I think it's going to pick off a, a significant percentage of those folks, and I, you know, I think uh, this is my dreaming, but I think in some ways, in fifty years, it might be as important as the as the agricultural domestication revolution that we had ten thousand years ago. Yeah, uh, we 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 reverse that. And uh, you know, we just we just um, we eat uh, that grown uh, meat. Those of us who need to eat it, and uh, the tremendous amount of acreage that's used for raising the the corn and the wheat and the soy to feed the animals to then feed us. You know that'll that'll cut way way back. So uh, th that's one of the things that I really hold on to as a hope because one needs hope these days because. You know, you know the data that's coming out the the, yeah. the biological proportionality uh, study, which, which un, un, I mean, that really shocked me. It, as I recall, it was something like um, sixty percent of the bio of the biological mass is wildlife is sorry is domesticated think, animals. Yeah, thirty four or thirty six percent is humans' bodies. And like four or five or six percent is wildlife. I mean that that fifty years ago it was that was not the case. So we, we, we're dealing with that. We're dealing with the uh, increased acceleration in in um, extinctions. Uh, so um, you know we need to we, th those are contexts in which we need to address all these issues, including the cat issue. Uh, it's relevant. Yes. Yeah, just to clarify, I'm I'm not saying that I I think that people should not. Yeah, that that everybody should be vegan and and um yeah. So I'm I'm vegetarian. I'm a lousy vegan. Um, and and I think yeah, I'm I'm all about being inclusive in in anthropology, human animal studies. But yeah, I I do think that yeah, we should be pro pro vegetarianism, pro um or, or vegan, pro vegan, not pro vegan as in you have. I'm not articulating very well. supportive of vegans. Supportive, yeah. <laughs> Well, you I mean, know, uh, Shea, Shea Green and I did this uh, informal study uh, some years ago in which we asked human animal studies scholars uh, whether they consider themselves animal advocates. And, you know, you know, a huge percentage said they, they, they did. Whether that translated into vegetarianism or not, I don't know. We didn't quite ask that question, but I'm sure it's fairly high. But um, I, I mean, my, my veganism is, is not for my body. It's it's to show other people that they they can do without animals and that you know uh, I lie about my age I say I'm 95 years old and I'm vegan you know and look at me uh, of course I'm only 80 uh, but uh, so uh, you know it, it's a it, it's a it's an education problem at bottom it's a cultural values problem at at bottom and uh, you know. We try to move people along slowly, you know. They, they so you give up veal, maybe you know. Maybe you'll give up veal. Maybe you'll give up uh, steak. Maybe, you know. And I, th I think one of the pro one of the problems that I, that I have is that that this this change when we when you say moving people along slowly, I mean, I think we're all aware that slow now is not a possibility. Perhaps you know we we need to be, but from what we're from what we're told, we need to be more more we need to move more quickly and and from what you were saying about the in vitro meat i mean you see a lot of people on social media saying even though i'm a carnist there's no way i'm going to eat that i'm not really eating lab grown stuff people have all their various reasons for for not for not doing that for not wanting that uptake and that's going to take a massive um change some massive kind of paradigm shift to make people change quickly if we need that and it also make, brings me back to the advocate point, or in my mind, it's bringing me back to the advocate point about human animal scholars, anthropology, critical animal studies, all of these different umbrellas that you speak about in, in various places, that if we are, if we are on the one hand having this uh, public face where we're advocating for 
change and we're advocating for less resources to be used and we're advocating for all these different things it sits very uncomfortably at least for myself and I'm not saying I'm perfect at all and it's very difficult to to uh, consider all of the effects that we the footprint that we have ourselves upon the planet but when some things are presented possibly easier to follow which has which reduces our footprint how them or that it, it, perhaps people have different ideas of advocacy, how they choose which part of their footprint to to look at. And it's just a statement, really, because I know it's it's um, it's not easy to do. But coming back to the, these different I, these different names, I was interested that you read. Sorry, that you wrote about anthrozoology being part of the um it's not a part of the dismantlement of neoliberal or capitalist systems. It's actually still part of the, it's trying to make change within the systems that we have. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, and you'd say, you say categorically that you think critical animal studies has a social justice agenda, but I'm wondering whether you think that, well, A, it, do you think there's an umbrella term for everything with all these different, the spectrum of people's advocacies underneath? And also, I think that anthrozoology itself has a spectrum. But do you think that? And could you comment on on that uh, on that that bundle of words? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So, so the name issue. Um, sure. Uh, we we all have faced the the problem of the name issue in that it we don't have a, a language that allows us to uh, refer to non-human animals without the term non-human in it. Uh, and, uh, you know, anthrozoology uh, certainly supports that categorical distinction as does human animal studies. Uh, but, you know, part of the reason we, we have the problem is because uh, the categorical distinction between humans and animals and the Cartesian stuff and the, the Christian Dominion stuff, uh, you know, they they helped shape the language, and we we don't have the language to turn that around. Um, in terms of the question about an umbrella term for the field, uh, I'm not very good pro prognosticator, uh, but. Um, at the moment, uh, it, it, it seems like. Uh, as you look at the, we have these resource pages in in human in animals and society institute. If you look at the different uh, universities and different organizations that have programs related to this, they're using the different names. I mean, some of them are CAS, some of them anthrozoology, some of them animal studies. Some uh, maybe that maybe it just continues that way. I don't know. Um, I, in the in the most recent paper I did on the state of the field, uh, I look I, I tried to name some red flags. Uh, so I mean I, I'm concerned if um, one discipline dominates because then we lose the interdisciplinarity. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, if if a very radical um, term becomes the umbrella term that we. Uh, become politically unviable uh if we rest on the uh dissolution of neoliberalism uh, we're going to be around for a long long time um <clears throat> so uh i don't know where it's going uh, i just tried to imagine some of the problems that that we might run into uh i see that um by and large uh the universities are uh accepting minors and majors uh, in the field uh we've got the one at eastern kentucky university which is it's st sort of started in the psychology department but now it's independent of that you can get a, a ba and I, I think i think he calls it animal studies bob mitchell i'm not sure you've got the thing at nyu that's going on that sort of combines environmental studies and animal protection um so, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I know how to answer that question. I think uh, we all go along for the ride. Uh, and uh, when we see uh, developments that are uh, have, have scary implications, we point them out. So. 
I guess that comes on to the the follow up question. It 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 all relates back to to methodologies. So I mean, I call myself an amphrozoologist. My PhD and MA was amphrozoology, um, but because the methods are so so, I mostly drew from qualitative social science. Um, others in the program are more sort of anthropology um, from anthro apology traditions and I guess in the US it is more psychology um so so we've got all these different methodologies under the umbrella of human animal studies and physiology and and I can I can see that sort of problematic in terms of finding examiners for PhDs I was very careful that I picked people that had the the methodological um similar similarities but we're tackling the same and I think that it's great that so the same questions and um, areas can be tackled from different methodological approaches under this sort of umbrella of amphrozoology, human animal studies. But then it becomes a question of training undergrads, masters. So what really then, if there's an amphrozoology undergrad degree, what does that really mean? Is it um, anthropology? Is it psychology? Is it? And I guess that's kind of what you're saying and part of the, or the, the yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah if you have a, an answer, but. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'm happy to talk, to jump in about that. Um, so um, the field has largely defined itself as as a study of human-animal relationships. Mm -hmm. And the term relationships is key because we had fields that were studying animals before uh, animal studies came in. And we certainly had fields that were studying humans, but they weren't studying the human-animal relationship. So that's that's the key, but that ha presents a, a tremendous methodological problem uh, because um, the scholar needs to know both about human behavior and human values and so forth and animal behavior, and not many of us know that. So it, it points to the possibility of collaborations. In terms of methodology, uh, yes, some of the fields have adapted their... Uh, heretofore human-centered only methods to include animals. So uh, symbolic interactionism, for example, alger and alger, uh, they, they push back against the, the notion that um, symbolic interactionism required a, a sophisticated linguistic ability on the part of the, and, and they push back against that. And uh, the contractarians have pushed back on that. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have interspecies at, at ethnographies now uh so uh i'm not sure whether there will develop um methods that are peculiar to specific to human animal studies or whether it will be mostly adaptations from particular disciplines psychology sociology uh even even literary studies, you know, there's an animal-centered literary criticism. Uh, is that a new method? Well, sort of. Um, but, you know, as, as, as I write in the paper, um, my view is that uh, what, what the umbrella that we're all under is the view that um, we're going to be looking at any phenomena, human-animal relationship phenomena, from the point of view of... Uh, who constituted it, how the animals constituted it, how the humans constituted it. Uh, we're going to uh, give equal standing to the animal's point of view. Uh, we're going to lean toward, uh, as a subtext, uh, the implications of that form of relationship for the animals in particular. We're going to be animal advocates. Uh, so that that's the, that's the bottom line. That, that's the meta-methodology. That's the hermeneutic to use the $25 word, um, that we, we all embrace. Uh, but then, you know, then there's qualitative approaches of which I, I, I'm primarily in that area. And then there's quantitative. Um, we could talk about the kinesthetic empathy maybe next time. But so um, in, in terms of methodologies, um, it, it's going to be very, very inclusive. Does... And, Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, it does make it tricky for people who are new to any of the animal studies fields, so, though, because there is this expectation, I know in my own experience with publication, that people expect you to know 
all of the methodologies, <laughs> all of the frameworks from all of these different fields, depending on where you're fitting your papers in. So it can become quite overwhelming that there's this expectation that not only do you know, you know, anthropology, you also know psychology and history. And it is, it is a little bit overwhelming. And I think that that's one reason why we get all of these different programs and program names, because this program may be anthropolo anthropologically based. And so they name it something different. And yeah. And one thing that we've discussed is that there appears to be a difference between what we here in the U.S. call human animal studies and anthrozoology and what people overseas tend really? to call it. Yeah, and uh, all of us, because we we studied at Exeter, are very much focus on that, you know, that our, our other than human animals uh, participants are equal. They're equally significant. Uh, we give them an equal voice in our work. Uh, but here in the wow. US, I feel like it's very much more, you know, animal assisted therapy based and more uh, human, human centered. Uh, so it's a little bit, yeah, it gets a little bit confusing. Okay, well that's, that's very informative to me. I did not know that Europe US distinction with respect to anthrozoology. I mean, I, I've certainly been aware that historically, um, the um, continent of Europe has been much more qualitative and theoretical and conceptual and all that. And the US and England have been much more uh, empirical and hard nosed, et cetera, et cetera. But so that's that's good for me to know that. Um, in terms of the, the challenge to students, um, I mean, my view of myself, uh, I, I began as a psychologist, but for the last 30 years, I've been doing human animal studies. I consider myself sophomoric in all the different disciplines. So, I mean, I really don't, I mean, I'm no expert in any of them, but um, I mean, I've enjoyed that. That's been great fun, you know, just uh, being able to at least converse at least at some sophomoric level in all the different disciplines and to then, you know, then to jump across them and so forth. But um, yeah, so again, uh, the, the challenge in education is tough. It, it is the primary um, education facility going to be simply animal studies or anthrozoology and not embrace a particular home discipline it's going to be its own home or is it going to have a home discipline if it has a home discipline then you're going to be learning mostly the problematics of that discipline and the methodologies of, of that discipline and trying to adapt them to the animal thing where is it going well, it sounds like it's a great field for someone who really likes to keep learning because you're always going to be working on I mean, That's what I found is I, you know, I love education. I love teaching. I love learning. And so it's been great for me because I'm constantly experimenting with new methodologies. So I've yep. enjoyed it. Well, I wanted to circle back around for just a minute then um, to the Animal Society Institute and just ask you, uh, the original goals that you had for ASI, uh, are those still the same goals? Are they still ongoing? And then what do you see as sort of the future goals for ASI? Wow, there's a question. Uh, great question. Um, so uh, when you say ASI, you, you, you're not, you don't want me to include Sayeta because that, that was a major shift. So Sayeta was... Well, Sayeta, Sayeta was much more narrow in its mission. It was focused on... Uh, the uh, critique, uh, both in science terms and ethics terms, of animal research in the lab. So, uh, I think in two thousand six or seven or five, we shifted to uh, ASI. So I'll I'll speak for, from that mostly. Yep. So uh, initially, the the mission, the the no, that's not the right word. The objective was to create help create this field of human animal studies. And we, you know, we had uh, book series and journals and we had summer institutes and we had uh, international uh, support for non-U.S. universities, et cetera, et cetera. And we developed all the resource pages and so forth. So uh, to some extent, um, if ASI no longer existed, the field would be there and it would be lovely and it would. So, so we don't need to be propping up the field as much. But um, in terms of our, our niche now, ASI, um, 
what we're currently really looking at is two things. One is making our policy paper projects more robust so that a, pro a policy paper would be built on uh, an evidence-based or theoretical piece that we publish or anybody published in any, any of the journals and, and talk about the current policies and the recommended policy changes that would come about through using this, this study. So we want a series of policy papers. The other thing we're looking at as a possible niche for us uh, is the DEI issue. So um, we, um, we want to try to um, increase the contributions from BIPOC, I'm using all these acronyms, I'm sure you're familiar with them, uh, for BIPOC uh, scholars and for scholars in uh, underrepresented geographical areas in the world. So that's something we're undertaking. And you know that's certainly in the interest of helping develop the field, but it's also in the interest of bringing in uh, these other folks. So that, that's a direction that we're, we're moving in. So those are the two. Um, the other thing we're continuing to do, and I guess I could talk about this another time, is the Anacare, the link effort. So, uh, but may, maybe we'll leave that for another talk. Uh, well, thank you very much for joining us today again. Uh, we had a wonderful conversation. And uh, don't forget to join us again on the next episode of the Anthropology Podcast.